Okay, guys, uh, my name is Elliot Kimmel, and this is my introduction to the digestive system video tutorial. It's recommended for grade 11 biology students in Ontario, Canada. And uh, what you see here before you in the screen is going to be an overview of the um, anatomical directions or orientations of the body. So, um, if you're a student in one of my classes, I want to suggest that you uh, pause the video and draw the little sketches I've got of these little stick men here and add the labels and then we'll come back and we'll talk about them in just a minute. So go ahead and sketch these out. Now, by the way, uh, if you are in my class, you likely have this handout here, okay? eight and a half by 14 inch paper or possibly eight and a half by 11 and you could do this on the back but you're going to need to leave some room for some other stuff that I've got on the next screen so if you use maybe half the side to do this and half the side to do that that would probably work or you can just do this in your notes itself okay so go ahead and make those sketches and then come back to the video all right assuming that you have the sketches now and the terminology let's go through it so in order to really best understand the uh, digestive system, it's good to have some anatomical directions here. So uh, let's start with this guy down here. All right, here's my little stick man. And you can see I've got some arrows and some, some labels on here. And so when you're looking at a structure that is um, towards the top or higher than something else, then the term superior applies. So for example, the eye here is uh, superior to the shoulder, okay? It's higher up in the body, all right? Um, by the same token, the term inferior down here refers to something that's lower in the body. In the body. So let's say you were talking about the pelvis down here. The pelvis is inferior to the shoulders all right or the nose is inferior to the eye or to the top of the head so we've got the term superior and we've got the term um, inferior um, when you're talking about a structure that is located towards the side of the body let's say the arm compared to the chest the arm is said to be lateral to the chest okay and that lateral of course works on either side of the body um, so if you were looking at uh, inside the body let's say you're talking about the esophagus uh, versus the lung or something like that you could still use those terms and I'll use these terms as we go on and look at some of the digestive anatomy as well um, we also have the term medial which means towards the middle and I'm gonna write these things down in just a moment uh, you're gonna write them with me so medial refers to towards the middle of the body so for example um, the heart would be located here right in the middle of the body uh, the spine of course is in the middle of the body so compared to the arm you say that the heart is a uh, is is medial to the arm or um, the heart is medial to the lung I don't know if you know where the lungs are the lungs are sort of off to the side like that they're not necessarily below the heart or anything like that so the heart would be right here right and it's the heart is medial to the lungs or you could say that the lung is lateral to the heart all right um we also have the term distal and proximal now proximal essentially means in close proximity to something so if we were looking at the knee here versus the foot um, the knee is closer to the foot than say the hips are right so the knee is proximal to the foot whereas the hips compared to to that original uh structure the knee the, the hips are distal to the foot so proximal and distal <clears throat> We also have the terms, <clears throat> excuse me, um, if you were looking at a, a side view, because it's, it's easier to see in a side view. If you're talking about something that is towards the front of the body, so we don't mean above as in superior, but we means towards, towards the front, uh, going in this direction, of course, um, that is the term anterior so anterior means towards the front so let's say the nose is anterior to let's say if i had the ear here right the nose would be anterior more towards the front of the body all right and like for example you know if you were drawing this guy's brain inside there right um the, you know there are structures like a structure right there is going to be more anterior than a structure that's right there so once again this is going to become more relevant when we start looking at internal body organs the flip side to this is the term posterior which means towards the back of, of something so you know the back of the head or the ear let's go back to the ear the ear is posterior to the eye or posterior to the nose it's more towards the back now a similar term is the word dorsal 
Dorsal means backside. So there's that guy's back. Dorsal means backside. So like the spine or this, you know, the skin on the back or, or well, we're going to look at this structure in a second. If you're talking about the fin of a fish, there's the, there's the dorsal fin. Whereas the term ventral means belly side. Now this arrow, just because it's pointing off this way, you know, I, I'm, I'm just sort of pointing to where uh, the term would be uh, located. It's referring to the belly side. So um, something on your, your belly, this is, this is your ventral side and this is, this is your dorsal side, all right? Now, again, because we are upright walking individuals, there can be some confusion between dorsal and ventral and anterior and posterior. And we'll, we'll write about this in a second again. Posterior means towards the back. So my back is posterior to my chest. My back is also dorsal to my chest, which is ventral. So because we're upright walking, our chest and our back is, is, is in the same orientation for these words. But if we come down and look at this organism here, which would represent uh, some organism on four legs, a quadruped, as opposed to something that's bipedal, upright walking, we can see that the back is the dorsal. So if this, this was a fish and it had some kind of a fin back there, that often is called the dorsal fin. Um, the ventral is, is the belly of the fish or the reptile or whatever it is. But now anterior, meaning towards the front, is different than ventral. Whereas here, anterior and ventral, they have sort of similar meanings. And posterior means towards the backside of the body or towards the end of the body, <clears throat> instead of towards the front. This word posterior is different than the word dorsal based on the orientation. So if this was a cat, okay, you'd have anterior towards the front, the face, posterior towards the tail, there's the tail, all right, uh, dorsal towards the back of the body and ventral towards the belly. But if you've got an upright organism like a human or something like that, then it becomes uh, a little bit more confusing. So let's go ahead and write some of these terms down. I'm gonna pull this down. Now I'm not gonna be overly neat in writing, especially with this tablet here. So I'm just gonna do my best. All right, so the term anterior Okay, so I'm going to ask you guys as well, now they just pulled that down and you didn't have that before, to go ahead and, and write this with me. All right, so you've got the drawings here and I've talked about them. Let's go ahead and write down the definition of all these medical orientation terms that I want you to know. So we'll start off with anterior and this means towards front. See how messy I can be there? Oh boy. All right, towards the front, towards the front of the body. All right, I'm not going to give you a specific example. We've talked about this and you could come up with others. Posterior means towards the back. Or, you know, this could mean behind and this could mean in front of. All right. So there you go. This structure would be behind, this structure would be in front of. The term ventral, as I said, means belly side. Or it could mean towards the belly, all right? So your navel, your, the mammary glands, the breastbone, um, all of these structures, okay, are belly side. Whereas dorsal means backside or towards the back of the organism. Once again, uh, you know, in a bipedal organism, posterior and dorsal are very similar, and ventral and anterior can be very similar. But if we got our typical, you know, a typical animal other than human, it's more understandable. The term superior generally means above. And you, if you've studied uh, grade 10 science and you did the heart, you may recall the superior vena cava is the large vein that's leading into the heart, okay, from above. And inferior vena cava is the large vein leading into the heart from below. So inferior generally means below. Okay, so we'll use these terms as I do the next diagram. Lateral means towards the side, so towards side. Medial means towards the middle or located in the middle. Okay, you say something is medially uh, located or it's medial. Proximal means close to, so it's in close proximity. So the nose is proximal to the eye compared to the mouth. <laughs> 
The mouth is therefore distal to the eye compared to the nose. So distal means far from. And of course, that far from is a relative term. It doesn't mean it's a mile away. It's just farther than something else. Okay, so make sure you get all of those terms down. And we're going to go on and look at the uh, digestive anatomy. And I'll try to remember to use as many of these terms as possible. All right. So if you're not quite done, pause the video, get those done, and then we're going to progress. Okay, so we are moving on now to the digestive anatomy. Now, you should have this diagram. All right. If you're in my class, uh, I just want to say right now that this is not my diagram. I did not draw this, so I don't know who to give credit to. But thank you very much to whatever artist did draw this. It's a very useful diagram. There are lots of great black and white labelable images on the Internet. So you should grab a few of those and put them in your notes for extra reference. Now, we are going to go through these, but the numbers don't necessarily go from top to bottom or in order of the digestive structures as the food is going through. And we're also not going to talk a lot about the functions. I'm going to allude to some of them, but we, of course, will be studying um, all of these digestive structures in some detail. All right, today we basically just want to want to label them, name them, uh, learn the spellings and, and their locations uh, in the body. So of course, uh, for the mammalian body, for the human body, we have uh, a few different sections of the body here. You don't have to draw this or anything, but we've got the head region up here right this is the diaphragm number four we're going to write that in just a moment um, but basically from the diaphragm and up we've got the thorax region so this is the thorax all right thorax and below that all of this stuff here this region and i'm going to erase this in just a moment just to give you orientation is the abdomen so we've got head thorax chest region and abdomen, abdominal cavity, thoracic cavity, and the head region, all right? Now, to do this, you're going to need this table with 25 structures, all right? So again, a suggestion is to do this on the back of the, the diagram, not right here, labeling them right there. That way you'll be able to study with the names separate from the structure, so you'll be able to learn them a little bit better. All right, we're gonna start up here in the head region. Number one, I'm gonna show you what that is right now. All right, so go ahead and copy these down as I'm, as I'm doing them. Number one is the mouth region, but we are going to call this the oral cavity. So this is where the food is going to enter the digestive tract, right through the teeth, which are there, and the food is entering. So this region here, in fact, I think I can actually pull this down just to highlight it. This region there under the pinkish red circle there is the oral cavity. Um, in the oral cavity, food is going to be physically or, or mechanically digested by the teeth and the tongue. So this is the beginning of physical digestion in the oral cavity. But there are also um, enzymes that are secreted into there. Now, they're not on this diagram. Whoops, sorry about that. They're not on this diagram, but get out of there. Okay. Um, up in this region here would be salivary, a salivary gland there, and there's some salivary glands down here as well. And these are going to release the enzyme saliva into the oral cavity. We'll be talking a lot about saliva and the en enzyme in there um, later. And that's going to be chemical digestion, the digestion of food with enzymes with chemicals so we're not going to do that right now today we just want to mention that this is called the oral cavity now in order to see this next structure i'm going to go to 24 and then i'll show you the name but i'm going to zoom in a little bit and we'll see how well this is is going to work um, i want to focus on this area right in here and then i've added this label to your diagram this is number 24 and you can see a little pointy thing here what happens is the food is in here this is the oral cavity right and <clears throat> it's mechanically and chemically broken down. And then when you go to swallow the food, it's going to come down here and it's going to go into this, this label right here. Now you don't see the number, but this is going to be the throat region or the pharynx, which we'll label in a moment. But you don't want to have food going back up into the nasal cavity. That's the nasal cavity there, because this is the spot where air is coming in, and the air is going to come down. It's actually going to go into a separate tube, but for this region, this is common to both the respiratory and digestive tract, and you don't want food going in there. That can interrupt with breathing, and that can be life-threatening. So there's a little flap of skin that as you swallow, let me clear that up for the moment. 
as you swallow this flap will push against the back of the skin right there so that the food can't go up and instead it's going to be you know directed down here and down into the esophagus so structure number 24 is called the uvula that's this flap of skin or tissue that prevents food from going up into the nasal cavity and like i said later on we're going to write down all the definitions of these things today is basic uh, general anatomy okay now i'm going to uh, zoom back out and we're going to move down the digestive tract so the food was in the oral cavity it passed by that uvula and it's now in region number 25 which is in this area here all right, and this is the throat area. It is common to both food and air, but it will then separate into two different uh, tubes, esophagus versus trachea, based on whether it's food or air. And so number 25 is the pharynx. That's the name for the throat region, and you've probably seen that term before. From there, the food is gonna pass into structure number three. So we're moving downwards down here, and number three is the esophagus. And we'll be studying the esophagus quite a bit, and you'll be looking at slides of the esophagus and learning the various layers. It's not just a simple, you know, tube like a garden hose. There's a lot more to it. So the esophagus will squeeze or contract, and the food will move down the esophagus by a process called peristalsis as the, as the muscles contract, pushing the food down, and it'll actually pass through this area right here. There's a line right here, number four, and it's a muscle, an involuntary muscle and this is the diaphragm it's the diaphragm is not specifically a digestive structure it's really a respiratory structure it helps um, move the lungs because the lungs are here and the lungs actually connect with the diaphragm and when the diaphragm pulls downwards when you breathe in it lengthens the lungs and that helps to pull air in but we're not going to talk about that today although we just did didn't we we want to talk about structure number four which is the diaphragm and that's just because the esophagus passes through there's a hole and it actually goes through the diaphragm all right so write down diaphragm for number four just understanding it's not really a digestive structure okay now i'm going to zoom in again on that area just going to move that out of the way and let's move this image down a little bit so here you can see let's get rid of that as well you can see the esophagus coming down through the diaphragm and down around here and now we're into the abdomen all right the diaphragm sort of separates the thorax from the abdomen and we're going to go into the stomach but in order to get into the stomach if you think of this as a tube and then a hollow organ there is a little um, gateway here a circular valve all right that's going to open to allow the food in close to keep the the food in when the stomach churns when the muscles squeeze you don't want food squirting back up into the esophagus so we're going to look at structure number 19 and i'll give you that right now this is called the cardiac sphincter now a sphincter is a is a valve made of circular muscle so just think of it as like a you're making your fingers in an okay sign and it squeezes to close and relaxes to open all right so this is a little valve that allows the food or doorway let's say allows the food to enter the stomach and then it will close up and then no more food can get in and no food can get out so that's called the cardiac sphincter and because the heart is up in the chest region up here and because this valve is sort of proximal to the heart close proximity it's called the cardiac sphincter we're going to look at another one later down here but it's a little bit more distal to the heart okay so cardiac versus versus the other name now i gotta zoom out so that you can see that that label we are looking at structure number five now five is obviously the stomach there's a lot to say about the stomach there are a lot of enzymes and there's a lot of mechanical digestion going on here we began mechanical digestion in the oral cavity not much is going on in the esophagus but we continue mechanical digestion in the stomach due to the muscles churning the food up we also began chemical digestion in the mouth using saliva more to say on that later and we continue chemical digestion in the stomach lots of enzymes going on there so number five is the stomach now i am going to zoom in one more time just bear with me so here we are in the stomach and the food is now going to be chemically and mechanically digested and very little of it by the way is going to be absorbed from the stomach 
into the bloodstream. Okay, that's called absorption. Not absorption is not into the digestive tract. Absorption means nutrients are coming out of the digestive tract into the surrounding bloodstream, which will then you know convey it to all parts of the body. So um, there's a, there's a little bit of absorption, but not very much. So the food then passes from the stomach, and of course the stomach will squeeze to push the food. The cardiac sphincter is closed, so it doesn't go back up the esophagus. All right, mind you, when somebody is sick and they vomit, this of course will open and the contents of the stomach will, the stomach will squeeze and the contents will go up the esophagus and out the oral cavity. And this is why, you know, your throat burns when you vomit because of the acid or HCL, the acid that is in the stomach burning the esophageal lining. We'll talk about that later. Anyhow, the stomach contracts, pushing the food. There's another valve, and I don't like where this label is ending, all right, because there's another one here indicating this tube region. So what I like to do, and I suggest you do it, is circle this little area, and that's really the area that I'm talking about. You could always erase this little extra piece if you like, but this area is another sphincter valve. So it's a circular valve that controls the exit of food from the stomach. So when food is in the stomach, right? Cardiac sphincter will close, pyloric sphincter will close, the stomach can then churn and keep the food in there, mix it with the acid and the enzymes, and then when it's ready, the this sphincter valve will open, I'll give you the name in a second, and the food will then be essentially squirted into this tube here, which we'll talk about in a moment. So let's zoom out again and get rid of that. We're looking at label number six. This is called the pyloric sphincter. Notice they have, they're both sphincters, but pyloric versus cardiac this one is more distal to the heart than this one okay so we're out of the stomach and we are now into the first region of the small intestine now this region goes somewhat from there to somewhere around here maybe a little further all of this region right here is being indicated by label number 11 and this being the first part of the small intestine look at what i've done I've given it the name, it's called the duodenum, okay, duodenum, and I've written S1, meaning small intestine region one, because there are three major regions to the small intestine. So just so you remember which they are in order, I've called that S1. Now, the small intestine continues lots of chemical digestion, very little mechanical or physical digestion, and we'll have a look at what's going on in here a little bit later on, but that's the duodenum. It would do its work and the food and nutrients or whatever you've got in there at the time would continue to move down and under here and continuing through the small intestine. And at some point in time, we're not going to worry about exactly where that is, but of course the next label comes up right about here. So, so a certain stretch of this is going to become small intestine region two, which will continue chemical digestion with plenty of enzymes but this is really where absorption occurs the nutrients will move out of the small intestine into the extensive surrounding bloodstream and if you dissect the fetal pig you are going to see the intestines and the membranes and all the blood vessels that surround it that would absorb the nutrients anyway we're on label 12 now and this second region of the small intestine is what we're talking about and this is called the jejunum this is S2, jejunum S2, second region of small intestine, duodenum, first part, jejunum, second part, and then the food would continue in the small intestine, continually being broken down to the smallest nutrients all the way down to the third region of the small intestine, which would, you know, be wherever the last one ended up into around there. This is labeled 20 now. This is the third part of the small intestine. And this is called the ileum, S3, third part of the small intestine. So duodenum, jejunum, ileum, DJI, DJI, duodenum, jejunum, ileum. The small intestine is the major site of nutrient absorption, all right? So a lot of chemical digestion and then where the, the nutrients are actually absorbed into the bloodstream. 
Um, the small intestine, of course, is somewhat distal to the stomach. It's very distal to the oral cavity. It's inferior in the body to the stomach, right? You could say the stomach is superior to the small intestine, or the small intestine is inferior to the stomach. The esophagus here is, of course, medial or located medially in the body and we can't really talk about anterior and and posterior and stuff like that in in this view okay we are moving on we are um at structure number 20 the food or what's left of it really is now going to enter into here now there is a valve here that i want to talk about later on Okay, so we're not done with those valves, but now the food, and really it's almost waste at this point, but waste plus water, is in this region, indicated by structure number 13. Now this region is a swollen region of the large intestine, and this is called, number 13, oops, this is called the cecum. Now I didn't put um, L1 or C1 for colon or L1 for large intestine one, because this is kind of like a blind sack just right at the very beginning of the large intestine. But this is where um, the waste material uh, with the water will go initially as it leaves the small intestine, and then it's going to make its way up. Uh, we're not going to talk about the function so much about that, um, but underneath that is number 14, and that's the appendix which is considered to be a vestigial organ. It's lost its function in higher mammals like us. And um, we're not going to really say much about it. It doesn't really have a function that we need to concern ourselves with. And so we're just going to leave it. But this is where it is uh, in the body. Okay, it's, this, is, this is the right side of the body, right? This is the right of this individual. And this is the left side of the body, right? You might look at it and say, well, there's the left arm. But really of this person, that's the, that's the right arm and that's the left arm. So this is, you know, there's the medial line right there. So the appendix is on the right side of the body, the lower right side, inferior really in the digestive tract, right? Okay, so let's follow the food up through the large intestine since so we've done 14. Yep, we've done 14. All right, here we go. It's going to move up here, and it's probably not a bad idea to do these arrows. I mean, it's hard to do it in the small intestine unless you're nice and neat, but uh, it's, it's not a bad idea to be doing it throughout the large intestine to get the flow of the materials through. So we are now up in structure number 21, and this is the large intestine or colon, and there are a number of regions to this. One region of the large intestine carries the, I'm gonna call it waste at this point, carries the waste upwards. So number 21 is called the ascending colon. Colon is, the, is another name for the large intestine. So I called this L1 because it's the first main region of the large intestine. This is called the ascending colon where the waste is moving sort of upwards or in a more superior direction in the body. From there, the, the waste is going to move across the body, all right, sort of transversely. And therefore, structure number 22 is the transverse colon and it's region two so we've got region one going up region two going across that's the transverse colon and then the waste is going to continue and go downwards like this in section 15. so section 15 is going to be the descending colon and this is l3 large intestine region three now, I should mention that the, one of the major functions of the large intestine is to reabsorb water. So as you, you know, went through the digestive tract, here we're mechanically and chemically digesting food. We're not absorbing any nutrients up there. In the stomach, we're mechanically and chemically digesting the food. Very little absorption there, as I said. Small intestine, major source of absorption of nutrients. But then what's left here, and to control the consistency of the feces, and you know that feces can vary in terms of, it, of how solid it is based on your diet, your health, and how much water you drink and all that, there still is some water in, in, uh, in the waste. And so one of the major functions of the large intestine is to reabsorb water, meaning not absorb it into the digestive tract but to absorb the water out from the lumen or the inside of the digestive tract the colon in this case 
out into the blood vessels, all right? So reabsorption of water is one of the major functions of the large intestine, and that can determine the consistency of the waste of the feces. Okay, for some reason the camera shut off there. Uh, let's keep going. So that was the, tre the uh, descending colon, and then there is a curve here, like an S-shaped curve as it comes along like this. All right, so we're looking at region number 23, and region 23 is called the sigmoid colon. So we have, you know, we've got four regions. We've got the ascending colon, the transverse colon, the descending colon, and now we're talking about this S-shaped curve called the sigmoid colon, L4, the fourth region. From there, the waste, at this point, it pretty much is waste. The water has been absorbed. And there it goes into a holding chamber, which is indicated by number 16. And that is going to be the rectum. And I've called that L5, the fifth, the fifth region. So ascending colon, transverse colon, descending colon, sigmoid colon, that curve. And then uh, the, fifth, the fifth one here is going to be the rectum right there. It's label 16. Okay, um, this is where the feces is stored until it can be released at the appropriate time. Structure 17 is again circular muscle. It is another sphincter valve, all right? And this is the anus or anal sphincter right there. Um, and it will control the actual release from the body of the, um, of the feces, all right? Now, those are the major digestive organs that are along the line of the digestive tract. In other words, food entering here, moving down here continuously into the stomach as if this was a car traveling through this crazy racetrack going in here and out. Although it curves around, it's one continuous path. We then have regions off of the main path, off there, and off there and these are the accessory digestive organs so we have a few more to do so let's just jump into let's do number 10 all right number 10 is inferior to the stomach and it is the pancreas now the pancreas has a number of digestive roles but it also has some endocrine roles with hormones and some other stuff so um let's see if we can zoom in on that a little bit we can see the pancreas here so the pancreas releases a bunch of enzymes you'll be learning a bunch of them and they go into this tube here and they travel through this tube and they act in the small intestine this is the duodenum the first region of the small intestine so the pancreatic enzymes function in the duodenum the pancreas also releases a number of hormones things like insulin and glucagon and these hormones affect blood sugar and they travel through the blood not through the digestive tract and usually they come over to the liver all right and affect and affect the liver so that's going to be the pancreas there let me zoom back out uh let's talk about number seven here number seven is the liver largest internal organ the liver produces bile which helps break down fats and the liver stores that bile in the gallbladder which is right here all right this is the gallbladder stores a chemical called bile we'll talk more about that later so that is the gallbladder it's on the underside of the liver in order to see this you've got to lift the liver up it's sort of inferior to the liver underneath but in this drawing it's laying right on top of it um, actually let me zoom in on that to make it look a little bit clearer all right so we've got the gallbladder right here and then the bile will travel through this tube and there's a name for this part of the tube and there's a name for this part of the tube all right and then the bile will travel down through here and out through here and bile also functions in the small intestine not in the stomach the tube does not go into the stomach it goes into the small intestine all right, so let's look at those labels as well. We've got number nine coming off of, the gall, off of the gallbladder. This is called the cystic duct. So when the gallbladder squeezes like a balloon with full, full of air, but it's got bile in it, that bile is pushed into structure number nine, which is the cystic duct, and it will then travel down into this collection duct. And you can see, I'm gonna zoom in again one more time. And you can see that number 18 is pointing to a tube like a highway that's made of two roads, this road and this. Well, there's actually more, but in this illustration, these two things come together to make a common tube here. <clears throat> 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 
and this tube number 18 is called the bile duct or it could be called the common bile duct all right so the bile duct carries bile down into the small intestine now where does that leave us well we labeled number eight did we forget to label number eight number eight is the gallbladder in case i forgot that number nine is the cystic duct and number 18 is the bile duct and that just leaves us with number two which was way back in the top again this is the tongue right here this is a muscle in the mouth an oral cavity this is the tongue all right so those are the major um, digestive anatomy structures uh, what we're going to do in the course is we're going to zoom in on many of them including the salivary glands which are not on this diagram and we'll be looking at you know what are the different teeth the canines the molars the premolars the incisors that kind of thing uh, we'll be looking at that we'll be looking at the anatomy of the esophagus under the microscope there are many layers to this all of the enzymes and chemicals and the anatomy of the stomach, et cetera, et cetera, as we work our way through the digestive tract, you will then be able to apply this to essentially any mammal. However, there are differences between mammals and uh, you'll be well on your way with your digestive system. All right, so I hope that helped. See you again soon.